It's not one we think about often, but when it happens, it's a very big deal over a very short time period, right? So there had been some work done to show that you know insect carcass infestations can cause up to seven to fifteen dollars per carcass of uh, damage when when it's really bad and. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast. Uh, and joining me in our illustrious podcast studios for this week's edition is Dr. Chris Rodemaker. Dr. Rodemaker is a clinical professor and the uh, swine extension veterinarian at Iowa State University, as well as the associate director of the Iowa Pork Industry Center. And Chris, um, on top of all of those titles, you're a multi-time uh, attendee and participant here in the podcast, which I know you're most proud of uh, as far as all your accomplishments. But in all seriousness, I know you're a super well-known guy in the industry. You've helped a lot of producers in a lot of places through the years. But for those folks who haven't had the pleasure of making an introduction, why don't you start with a brief introduction for the audience? Yeah, you bet, Clayton. Thanks for having me on again uh, to talk today. Yeah, so a little bit of my background. I was uh, born and raised in southern Minnesota, graduated from the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine in 1998, and went back and helped my neighbor start up a small little company called New Fashion Pork and spent the next 11 years helping him kind of grow that from 1,000 sows to about 60,000 sows and one of the original members in Triumph Foods, one of the first producer-owned packing plants. Uh, from there, I spent uh, five and a half years with Smithfield Foods uh, working as a director of production improvement in their Western operations. So that uh, put me down in the Ames, Iowa area, uh, working with uh, 11 different veterinarians, oversaw uh, 7 million market pigs a year. And then in uh, December of 2014, I joined the uh, faculty at Iowa State University, uh, where I am currently at today, wearing all those different hats that you told the audience about. Chris, um, you, uh, you have a lot of experience with pig health and pig production in a lot of areas. Today, we're going to go into a very unique uh, pig health challenge, and we're going to talk about some challenges with pig health related to insect management. Um, and uh, uh, really a category of health management called integrated pest management. And while we think of drugs and bugs, right, PERS and, and vaccines and medicines and that sort of stuff, um, the reality is uh, a bad insect infestation at the wrong time in your pig production cycle can ruin some of your hog carcasses. Maybe not ruin them, but really devalue them. And you recently had an experience where you got called in with some other experts at the university to help out a combination of a uh, uh, packer and producers shipping pigs to them that was experiencing a big problem with insect challenges. And just to set the stage for the audience to make them appreciate how big of a deal this can be, talk us through the situation, kind of the case study you guys had and what you what you ultimately learned and did to try and help it out. Yeah, you bet, Clayton. I appreciate that. And like you say, it's not one we think about often, but when it happens, it's a very big deal over a very short time period, right? So there had been some work done to show that you know insect carcass infestations can cause up to seven to fifteen dollars per carcass of uh, damage when when it's really bad. And we had a situation uh, in the in June of June July interface of 2024 where we had received a whole gob of rain, about eight to ten inches, kind of in the the northern northwestern part of Iowa and lo and behold a couple of weeks later we got calls from uh, some producers working with the, the plant and they're like we're overrun with all these insect we suspect they were insect blemishes weren't sure exactly what they were and they're like you know it went from just a couple of loads to like up to 50 percent of the loads over a very short time period right and it's like you know we need some help. We've got producers. They're not sure what to do. So, so yeah, as you said, we we got uh, Dr. Griner, Dr. Ramirez, uh, and myself. Uh, we just said, hey, we got to put something together in just a matter of a couple of days. So, uh, with Dr. Griner and I having some production background, we we knew how urgent this was, and we knew how quick it was it, it was needed to put something together to help the producers and the packer out. So. You know, we weren't exactly where to where to start either. The beautiful thing about it is we knew we needed to get some experts involved to help us out. And 
And really with that, when you talk about integrated pest management, the first thing people always think about is, oh, I got to, you know, spray my barns or spray the pigs to do it. But what we started to learn, we started to get connected to some entomologists that work either for USDA, worked within the university, or even for a lot of the uh, allied industry companies that sell those products. There's a wealth of knowledge out there that we don't really routinely access. So I think of all the things that we'll talk about here, that was probably the, the first step is like engage an entomologist because there's like over 50 different uh, species of mosquitoes and they all can all be a little bit different and your approach may be different because of the habitat they live in and the distribution when they attack or where they where they reproduce at right so it's really important that's kind of what we learned about there there was kind of three big steps when we talk about integrated pest management and that was a term we got from the entomologist right i never really heard that much before either. And there's really kind of three key cogs to that. The first one is surveillance and identification, right? So, you know, that can be, you know, very cheap to very elaborate. You can use light traps and CO2 dry ice as attractants. And actually one of the ones that was probably the cheapest and easiest from the USDA entomologist uh, that we consulted with in the case. And they're like, just get fly sticky cards and put them wherever the spider webs are because the spiders know, you know, spots in the barn where there isn't a lot of ventilation, you know, that the insects will probably be hanging out in, right? So they're, they're like, whatever method you use, you know, just get those in there, set them in there for 24 to 48 hours and then get them to us and we'll help you speciate, you know, because certainly we tend to think mosquitoes most often, but you can have problems with stable flies or other other flying insects as well that can cause some of those the damage so you know doing the surveillance and identification was really kind of the first case and that was what we wound up doing we worked with a prominent producer we had one of the entomologists come out they set out some of the traps and uh, did some of that identification what we didn't realize at the time as we started doing it is actually in the state of iowa uh, the entomology department does a routine mosquito surveillance. So it was really interesting on, on that. And that's all available online. And we looked at what we found in the trap compared to what they were finding throughout the state of Iowa and in the species that we were dealing with, uh, which was Culex tarsalis, was um, you know, turned out to be exactly the same. You know, and those are they're kind of aggressive. They're like it was like, you know, the Dracula or Frank and mosquito, right? Like they're aggressive, they're day biters, uh, you know, they're associated with animal congregation, you know, all the things that we, that we're worried about. I mean, that was like the worst possible situation, right? So, you know, we, but once we knew what we were able to deal with, you know, then we could start looking at things such as, okay, so what do we have to do to manage the site, you know? And so we started talking about looking at, uh, you know, eliminate any standing water, right? You know, utilize, uh, you know, certain um, uh, larvicides that can be used in standing water for places where you couldn't drain it, right? You know, things looked at site maintenance, right? Like, you know, keeping, you know, making sure you have a good rock barrier around the buildings, making sure that, you know, keep the grass short because some of those species will, you know, they'll survive during the calm parts of the day, you know, on long grasses outside. So if you keep the grasses short for some species, that's a, a good mitigation technique, right? And then, you know, look at other areas, you know, make sure you don't have curtain pockets in these finishing barns, you know, that aren't retaining rain or mist or water, right? So it's a lot of this is really just kind of this environmental assessment looking for things that we could do is we got digging deeper into it you know we were finding that uh when they started looking at the loads that were affected it looked like we were having more issues with naturally ventilated buildings than tunnel ventilated buildings so we started looking at things such as trying to keep stir fans on right so that in the middle of the night we didn't have situations where we had mosquitoes coming in with no ventilation on really warm evenings uh you know creating situations where, you know, they could be attacking the, uh, the pigs and, and, and biting the carcasses at that time, right? And then tunnel barns, another thing, you know, for those that were having issues in tunnel barns, you know, you may just want to keep them in tunnel even during the night, adjusting your, your ventilation and then just making sure your misters, you know, the waters and sprinklers are all properly adjusted and the timers are set right so they don't create any issues with, you know, standing water. So, you know, that's really kind of the second piece of that is that whole environmental assessment with that. And then you eventually you do kind of get to the third leg on that stool, which is kind of the chemical mitigation portion of that, you know. So we learned a lot about, well, there what 
what are the different options that are out there? You know, you got two kind of primary categories. You've got kind of a non-residual or contact spray. Those are ones that you can actually get uh, on the animal or in the barns. And a lot of those tend to be like permethrins, pyrethrins. So they're natural. They come from the chrysanthemum flowers. So, you know, we were just trying to gather resources on ones, you know, they do come with a little bit of a, of, of a withdrawal time on certain products. So one thing that we learned is like, definitely read the label. You know, this is all controlled by the EPA, not the FDA. Yes, as veterinarians, we're used to having some flexibility on the label. Uh, EPA, there is no flexibility. Whatever is on the label is what you have to do, you know, without question. So, um, but we looked at some things, you know, utilizing some of those um, uh, different uh, pyrethrins or uh, permethrins in like fogging devices. So, you know, ones that you can just easily access, you know, on Amazon, you know, using, you know, like Ryobi or any of those commercially available ones were good for, you know, fogging some of those areas in terms of actually killing the, the adults that are in there at that time. You know, the other category there is looking at residual sprays, which are good for the actual surfaces themselves. So when they land on there, they they become uh, contaminated uh, and then it can kill them that way. You got to be really careful with that. You want to make sure those uh, are definitely for not on the animal use. So you need to make sure when you're looking at the different options, you differentiate the two with those. And then there are different meth uh, mechanism of action products there. So you want to be doing some rotation uh, of the, them as well. So we were able to put together a document that we put up on the Iowa Pork Industry Center website. Um, you know, that, that to help them out that we got the document to the to the uh, packer, they went ahead and distributed to their producers. And, you know, within a couple of weeks, they saw the incidents drop right back off. But we're like, well, we know this doesn't happen very often. But if you're in a situation and and, you know, uh, you're looking for resources, we wanted to have a place we could put all those resources together. Another thing about that, too, is like. Don't wait until you start marketing to start thinking about it. This really is, particularly when you're looking at the environment, this is things as you're you know, starting to get ready to think about marketing. That's when you need to start looking at the environment, particularly if you've had a lot of rainfall at that, you know, at that time around there where we know that this could be an issue. That's when you want to start looking at the environment, you know, making sure you have your ventilation adjusted and then have any of those products on hand in case you need to use them. It sounds like your typical health situation, Chris. You know, if you have a problem, you identify a problem, you've obviously got to treat it. But the best medicine is always preventative medicine. And if you can do things to reduce standing water, uh, run your ventilation to, uh, to minimize the negative impact of biting insects, particularly at the time of year where they're an issue, that kind of holistic approach or integrated pest management, right? Doing the prevention as much as you can, that's going to help give you the best results versus just waiting until the packer calls you and says, you got a problem, you got to do something about this. I mean, the reality is if you use some of those treatments, you may kill the mosquitoes or help in the short term. However, comma, all the bites that are there, they're going to take days, if not weeks to resolve on that skin. Is that fair? Yeah, hundred percent agree. And, you know, in our case, we were dealing with mosquitoes. And the problem is if you don't get that standing water taken care of or treated, you're going to kill that adult batch. And then the next batch is right behind it, you know, that got to come in. So you bet. Yeah. You got to be always be thinking about the life cycle, right? What can I do to interrupt that life cycle at multiple places throughout their throughout their uh, their whole life? And none of us like to get a call from the packer giving us bad news. But the reality is, Chris, you know, you and I I could be putting hogs on a truck today, not really see anything in the barn, but then when they get the hair off those pigs, when they wash those pigs and they see that kind of naked skin right there, it's a lot easier to appreciate those lesions of the plant. So you got to respect when the when the packer gives you feedback saying, we're seeing something, you may not be seeing it in the barn and, and both sides are telling the truth. It's really hard to appreciate in a live pig, but man, when that pig's on a shackle, it stands out like a sore thumb. Yeah, hundred percent. Actually, in the document that we put together, we put some of the pigs that were in Larridge, and if you looked really hard, you could see some of the bumps. And yeah, after they go through the scalder and the dehair, it's just like stands out like a like a sore thumb for sure. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance, and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typha murium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boringer Ingelheim representative to learn more. 
I mean, you mentioned some big financial losses, and obviously the skin's got a lot of value to the packer. So if you're a big packing plant and you're you're got a hundred you twenty thousand pigs a day coming through the plant. 10 bucks a hog. I mean, that is an unsustainable problem. So appreciate you and the folks at Iowa State jumping in. Um, you, you mentioned you guys have that nice PDF out there. Let's make sure to mention that again, Chris, in terms of where people can go to get that document. You bet. Yeah, I would say just go to the Iowa Pork Industry Center website. So that's www.ipic dot iastate dot edu and then you go and you'll find the health and diseases uh tab you just pull it down from there and there'll be a link that will take you to the extension store where you can get your hands on that document that document and lots of other awesome information chris thank you very much for coming on and sharing that with the audience it's always a pleasure to have you on here yeah my my uh, sincere appreciation for allowing us to get that information out to producers very good. Well, um, it's our audience showing up that allows us to do it, Chris, um, and uh, would appreciate anybody out there. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, liking and subscribing to the podcast, that helps the algorithm, helps drive this good information to more producers, more veterinarians, more allied industry who can use this stuff. Um, if you haven't been to our website, check out www.swinehealthblackbelt.com. Uh, you can find some great information there, including all of our historical podcasts that we put out through the years. For Dr. Chris Rodemaker, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. It's been our pleasure to chat with you, and we certainly hope you have a great rest of your day.